I was here earlier this morning and I got a chance to meet um, a few of you then, um, but uh, didn't have a chance to really speak a whole lot until now. I'm actually going to try and speak less than uh, planned, um, simply because I think you've had a lot of presentations today and I really want to focus on discussion as much as possible in this session. I think we all have value, valuable perspectives to contribute and um, I think at this point in the day especially that's um, more likely to keep us awake than another presentation. So. Um, I wanted to start out, though, by going back to the presentation this morning on IHD. And there was a question that came up about, you know, what is it exactly uh, behind IHD? Is it the Catholic piece? Is it, you know, the links to uh, other, you know, secular frameworks? What is it that you want us to emphasize in our teaching? And I just wanted to go back to that to, to um, go a little bit deeper on that question because I think it is uh, an important sort of foundational uh, piece for CRS. Um, and if you recall in some of the documents that hopefully you had a chance to read before coming, we made a distinction between what we call IHD as a concept or a principle from Catholic social teaching, uh, particularly found in the encyclicals, um, and then the IHD framework, which is something that CRS developed to, we sometimes use the word, perhaps somewhat crassly, operationalize. Uh, that is to, to be able to, to implement this in sort of a practical way, not at the high level, 30,000 feet, you know, uh, nice um, uh, language, but like what's happening in real people's lives, um, particularly overseas in the com communities that we serve. Um, and so when we do training on IHD, we really like to distinguish between those two. Um, IHD is, is something, I mean, they're linked in the sense that we, we're, we have an outcome that we're looking for through that framework, and that outcome is integral human development, people being able to realize their full human potential. Of course, that's rooted in Catholic social teaching. Um, but to get there, we draw on more secular tools, perhaps, which we've enriched, I think, with elements of Catholic social teaching. For example, you find the spiritual assets, which probably in more secular frameworks, you're not going to find reference to that. Um, that's something that's probably a bit more specific to CRS. But I think also the focus on um, root causes of injustice, which you often find in those structures and systems, that too, I think, speaks very much to um, what we get from Catholic social teaching. It's not just about building up people's assets. If you think back to the talk you heard from Chris Tucker this morning about Rwanda and our experiences there, I think much of our programming perhaps was only focused on building up people's assets before. And while those assets are important, it's not just about those. You have to look at what's underneath that and what may be causing some of the injustices so that you're, if you're only focused on, on rebuilding assets without paying any attention to some of those root causes of injustice, Ultimately, you're not really building something very sustainable, and we certainly found that out in Rwanda, as well as some other places, I think, as, uh, as well. So um, Tom Bamett spoke this afternoon about peace building. Again, one of those lessons learned from Rwanda, and that's something also that you, you find very much um, present um, in, in uh, CIRUS's work through the IHD framework, and I think it's, it's very specific to um, who we are as a Catholic institution. So I just wanted to start there. Um, sort of setting the stage for this because what we're going to talk about in terms of food security is actually very much related to IHD. CRS uses a very holistic approach uh, to food security um, that goes beyond any one sector, be it you know, agriculture, health, water, microfinance, etc., and tries to really pull all those things together. And we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, this afternoon. Hopefully you all had a chance to, to read a, a case study. Um, I think you had it um, in your, your preparation materials. I have actual hard copies here, and I, maybe I will just pass those out for people as well. Um, I'm gonna... um, and then I also have this um, food security framework. I have, go ahead, hard copies of that for people. And then I just have a brief um, session outline as well. That, Be helpful for people. No, not at all. That's fine. Go ahead. So my objectives in this session were, first of all, to um, help participants to gain an understanding of the CRS approach to food security and how it links or contributes to integral human development. We talked a little bit about that already in terms of the IHD uh, framework. Um, and then also help participants to reflect on the CRS approach to food security and how it could be tailored for students in the classroom. I thought we wanted to kind of start building the bridges toward that practical piece that I think tomorrow will be largely focused on. Hopefully you've already been 
reflecting on that today a little bit. And that's one of the reasons why I chose this particular case study. I thought it could be an interesting um, piece that could be used in the classroom to look at what does food security mean in practice for, for CRS in our field programs. Um, I'm going to talk for no more than 10 minutes. And we have two faculty respondents um, who may talk for less than 10 minutes from what they've told me. They're welcome <laughs> to use their full time if they'd like. And that'll leave at least half an hour for discussion, uh, perhaps a little bit more depending on how, how long we drone on. Um, but feel free also to interrupt with your questions. I'm very used to sort of an open participatory style, and I welcome that. I think that's helpful. So um, let's see, I think I can do this. Oops. There we go. So I wanted to start out by just stating why is food security important for CRS? Um, I think, first of all, it starts with a, a quote I took from Caritas and Veritate, one of the papal encyclicals. I think you're probably all familiar with it, um, where integral human development is mentioned quite a bit uh, all throughout. And there's a section of it, actually, that's devoted to issues of hunger and food security. The right to food, like the right to water, has an important place within the pursuit of other rights, beginning with the fundamental right to life. I think that summed it up pretty nicely in terms of why this is so important for CRS. It, just in terms of facts and figures, um, there's a report that came out in, uh, I believe it was February or March, um, about uh, hunger uh, as measured by undernourishment, child underweight, and child mortality. Those are sort of three proxy measures that are used uh, widely by um, uh, practitioners. There are 26 countries. I think we work in probably 23 or 24 of them, if I remember correctly, where there are either alarming or extremely alarming levels of hunger. I don't recall exactly the um, what is the threshold for determining alarming or extremely alarming, um, but it's definitely cases uh, where it's a significant problem. Um, what's interesting, as I recall, is that some of those countries actually are countries that we might even consider middle-income countries, places like India, for example which um, certainly on an elite level has done very well, but there's a huge number of people in that country who are still very food insecure. Um, so it's, it's particularly interesting to see. It's not just those countries that we would expect, like the Somalias or the Ethiopias, et cetera, um, but you also find even some middle-income countries where people are falling through the cracks like that. I think another important point is the food price crises. Um, in 2008, um, these have happened before, certainly, but the two in most recent memory are, were in 2008 and then more recently in 2011 when there was another spike. And then we've also had um, uh, significant droughts recently. Trish spoke to that a little bit this morning in both the Horn of Africa and the Sahel, um, which have put uh, increasing numbers of people at risk. Part of this could be related to the effects of climate change, um, and I think that's something that we'll look at when we um, see the uh, study of the food security framework um, that I passed out to you a minute ago. And finally, another important point, even today we're unable to feed the 7 billion people who are here. But we're expected to, uh, the world population is expected to grow to about 9 billion um, by 2050. Um, so that means that we have to be producing far more food than we are today. Um, so just in terms of availability, that's that last one, needing to produce more food. Access, which is sort of the, the, the economic side of it, can people afford to buy food? And then finally, um, the uh, uh, issues of uh, undernourishment, child underweight, and child mortality very often are also related to utilization of food. What kinds of food are people eating? Are they eating enough nutritious and diverse foods um, for a proper diet? Um, so um, you may not be able to read all the fine print from back there. That's why I printed out a copy for you. I think you've all seen this already if you had a chance to look through the materials. CRS developed a food security framework um, to help guide our programming in this area, realizing that food security is a big issue. It's one of those um, things that actually fits pretty nicely with the integral human development framework because it is so holistic. You can't reduce food security to one sector. It's not just about agriculture, about growing more food. It's not just about health, about eating uh, better quality of food. It's not just about water, having enough clean water uh, for, for, to, um, for people to drink and to, um, uh, for, for animals as well as for crops. Uh, it's not just about money, having the income necessary to buy food in the market when you don't produce enough of your own food. It's all of those things put together. And you can't just focus on one or the other. You really have to look at them all uh, to really have sustainable impact. So what we tried to do here 
is to put together all of these into a, a semi-coherent framework. I say semi because there's a lot that's packed in here, and I want to try and unpack that a little bit for you today. Um, you notice we start with a base of integral human development. That's really the foundation that we work from in terms of our programming. It's also, I guess you could say, our goal in a way, but I like to think of it as the base because it's, it's where people are. It's the, the assets to which they're, they have access. It's the, the structures and systems, the shocks, the cycles and trends, all those things that you heard about this morning. That's what people are working from, and we need to have a full understanding of that before we can really design any programs uh, to address deficiencies in that. Our goal, sustainable improvements in nutrition, food security, and livelihood. How do we get that? How, how do we get to that? Um, we work in partnership. I think, as you're aware from what Sarah told you this afternoon, uh, partnership is a very important part of what we do. CRS does not implement its programs on its own. We work with local partners at various levels. It may be governmental partners. It may be uh, Caritas uh, agencies. It may be um, other secular partners. It may be small community-based organizations on the ground. Uh, but we also work with the private sector. Um, our new CEO and president is trying to encourage us to do that more. Um, and particularly for food security programming, we know that's very important, trying to link farmers to markets, for example. Um, we also work with governments, because you have to work at a policy level sometimes, our own, starting with our own government in terms of the policies regarding trade, foreign aid, food aid, et cetera. Um, uh, and uh, we work with local governments also in the countries uh, overseas where we work. We use a definition of um, food security that comes from USAID, um, and it's focused on availability, access, and utilization. Um, I referred to those in, in the previous slide, I'm trying to give you some examples of how that's important. Availability really uh, um, talks about the production piece. Um, is there enough food that's actually being produced? Access is much more sort of the economic piece in terms of do people have the resources they need to go out and, and, and buy the food? Are there markets where they can purchase it uh, for that matter? And finally, the utilization is more people's knowledge and actual practices in terms of their nutrition. Um, do they have access to a variety of diverse, nutritious foods? You have to look at all three pieces of those um, to be successful in your food security work. And to do that, we develop programs in a range of sectoral areas. And I, highlight these three. There's a fourth one that's kind of hidden in there, and that's water, um, agriculture, microfinance, and health. There's some specific program components under each, each one of those. I don't think we really have time to go into these in depth, but what I was hoping in giving you the case study is that you would be able to identify uh, some of these components in the program in Burkina Faso. Um, you probably won't find all of them because no program will, will include everything. It's, it's very much based on the context and the needs there. Um, but there are hopefully more than one or two elements uh, that are included in, in programs that we develop. Um, we also need to look at what we call asset protection. Um, and that we find in, for example, emergency response, such as what we're doing in the, uh, the droughts in the Sahel and the Horn of Africa, uh, but also safety net programming. Those populations who are chronically needy, trying to help the institutions uh, for example, um, the Missionaries of Charity is the one that comes to mind most immediately, uh, Mother Teresa's organization. Um, we also have cross-cutting themes, um, things that really cross, cut across all sectors. So capacity strengthening, I think Sarah spoke earlier with you about that. Community engagement, disaster risk reduction, gender, governance, all of these are things that no matter what type of programming you're implementing, it's important to look at them. And finally, I think I already mentioned the advocacy issues, and that's particularly with the public sector um, where you can advocate uh, for better policies, uh, policies that will help farmers, <coughs> policies that will encourage better nutrition for people, um, and that will promote uh, better access to markets. That's basically what we use as our food security <coughs> framework. Um, it's very broad. It covers an awful lot. Some would argue that we've left pieces out. Um, there's actually a piece that we did leave out of there and I'm not going to mention what that is. You may have found that in your case study because it's in there. Um, but fortunately, um, we do a lot of it in our programming. Uh, now everyone's going back to their case study to look for it. So I'm going to stop there.